Hello, once again, welcome to the Law Professor's channel. In today's presentation, we shall be looking at the factors that the courts use to determine the entitlement or the, the, the exercise of their discretion in awarding maintenance to a party under the Matrimonial Courses Act. I uh, laid some foundation with respect to that in previous presentations. And um, in this respect, we want to look essentially at the provisions of Section 70 of the Matrimonial Courses Act and the interpretation of these provisions by the courts, Section, uh, section 70, subsections 1 and 2. So we go to our um, presentation by sharing uh, my screen. Um, so in this respect, let's look at our learning outcomes. What are the learning outcomes in this respect? We have four learning outcomes for today's presentation. We are going to be able to understand how the courts exercise their discretion in granting maintenance under the Maternal Forces Act. We should be able, at the end of the presentation, to explain the factors that aid the court in the grant of maintenance. We should be able to explain the judicial exercise of that discretion, that is the case law perspective, and also explain how assessment of maintenance is done. Having laid the foundation in previous presentations that maintenance is a financial award as against a property award. Now, the court order on maintenance, we first, uh, as focal point in terms of a uh, Law is section 71 and 72. Uh, we've said that we've identified the differences between the two provisions, but they both allow the courts to make an order of maintenance. Uh, one, the permanent order, 71, and the other, a temporary order. But in making these two orders, the court is expected by section 17, says that the courts will have regard to the means, to the earning capacity and the conduct of the parties to the marriage and all other relevant circumstances. So you can see there the means, the earning capacity, you can see 72 as well, the one about maintenance pending the cost should have regard to the means, the earning capacity and conduct of parties to the marriage and all other relevant circumstances. And these are confirmed in many cases in the law and dumb law. Now, the um, judicial discretion is what it says. You don't come to the court to claim maintenance as of right. And considering the nature of family law litigations, it is therefore left to the court to determine the light of the facts of each peculiar case, whether it is going to grant the order of maintenance, and if it grants it, what exactly will be the content of that order. And so it is a discretion, and um, in the case of Heahona and Heahona in Mafidon, the court said the relevant circumstances not gathered from the court itself, from the facts of the case, that is the pleadings that they bring before the courts. And then you see the case of Nana and Nana too, which says that the court must seem to achieve what is fair and equitable based on the evidence adduced before it. So maintenance is not an award to wives, alone or to husbands alone. Uh, it is meant to be gender neutral any, for any of the parties, either party to the marriage would actually apply and um, the court should aim for fairness and equity and the light of the circumstances of each case. It is of note that common law provisions on maintenance are no longer relevant on alimony rather. You know, at common law you could actually grant alimony and uh, what it does is that um, it is granted to the wives. Uh, we've explained that in previous presentations and discussions. It is a claim that the wife can bring against the husband for maintenance. But it, common law principles are no longer available now under the MCA because the ideology of the MCA is quite different from the common law perspective. It, MCA presumes that there is quality I need a party in need of maintenance. Now the um the the court in giving this maintenance 
is meant to look at these factors that we have mentioned. So it is now expected that every student and every practitioner will be able to explain what is meant by means. The 770 says the course should have regard to the means, you know, of the parties. The courts have defined means to include the pecuniary resources of the parties, financial resources. It may be in capital form or it may be income. It may be actually end or contingent, like you're expecting to it. Like, for instance, your rent expectations, your dividends that you're expecting from your shares. So it may be end or it is contingent, but it's all the resources available to the parties will be examined vis-a-vis -vis each other to determine that maintenance is necessary. Because maintenance is a needs assessment function, like I said in previous presentations. So if you don't actually need it, you don't come for it, and you're not, you're not trying to share family property or marital assets. That's not what maintenance is about. It's about correcting the economic imbalance that could result from after a divorce has taken place. So if both parties are financially stable and not really is in need of maintenance, then from the other, the court is not going to grant it. And it is not advisable that you encourage your clients to apply for it. The court will look at, the, therefore, all the resources available to the parties to the marriage, including their uh, respective assets and liabilities. It looks at the income. You know, are you in salary? Are you a business person? What are your profits? You know, looks at the assets and, you know, real property. Whatever you can that come into within the context of assets and income and what have you. Um, discussions about whether you could construe things like um, certificates, degrees, and whatever as assets could be taken in subsequent presentations. But in some jurisdictions, they be construed as um, you know, as things that improve your earning capacity, such that when they want to share family assets. They will be part of what we considered, but we will not take that in this presentation. Now, the so you look at the case law perspective to look at the meaning of means. Henning capacity also has been defined and explained as actual ability of a party to hang income, whether it is actually hang or merely potential. For instance, you are a student in university, one could foresee, project what any capacity to be by the time you become a lawyer. You know, every capacity will be derived from the property and financial resources, financial needs and responsibilities. And it, it includes your current income from what you are doing and what you should be able to do, which you are not yet doing. So it is it, it involves a lot of projections and assessments, you know, within the com com confines of the law. And um, the marriage of Beck, very good at Australian case, said that um, if you have assets that are even able to yield income, for instance, and you are not using them for that purpose, they'll you'll be assessed, as, you know, even where you're not so using. For example, you have a building that you could have led to him to get rent, and you are not doing so for whatever reason. It could come within that, it, it has potential to give you income. In order to determine your earning capacity, the courts have said they will look at age, how old you are, affect what kind of, whether you can even work at all. And you can, a case like Ajaya at Banji, where the demand for 37 years and the woman was in her 60s, the court said that her earning capacity was practically nil. Who is going to employ a woman at that age? Uh, what kind of job should she be able to get? You know, so age could affect your earning capacity. Your state of health, if one of the parties' health is falling apart, it could affect ability to, to, to earn income. The skills, what are the skills that the parties have? This would impact their earning capacity what responsibilities they have so that if they have responsibilities. And these are the things that interfaces that take place between issues of gender. For instance, if you have a, a wife that has young children, the capacity to earn income may be restricted in terms of the fact that the, in, the kind of kinds of jobs she may be able to get may be restricted and may not be a full potential. The court may look at the standard of life that the parties enjoyed before the dissolution of marriage, that in that weighs on even the assessment. What what in what is even given as a maintenance award, you know, and it also affects how the court will try to collect, correct the imbalance in the virtual order. The duration of marriage, in a way, would affect 
you know, what you are assessed to be entitled to, you know, it also affects your, your healing capacity in the sense that, for instance, if your marriage has been for a long time, 20 years, 30 years, maybe you have had a wife that you said, no, she should not walk, and she's never walked. So she will lack experience if she's trying to get a job now for the first time. So these are some of the things that are interwoven in the, in the issue of assessment. What of the factors that will determine whether you are entitled to maintenance or you are bound to give maintenance or in the award, the assessment of the amount you are entitled to at the end of the day, where the court says that the person is entitled to a maintenance order. The employment status too goes a long way in determining some of these issues. Now, the um the earning capacity that we have talked about, you know, the court moves from there to look at conduct. In some jurisdictions, you would and some texts you'll be having arguments about, oh, is it um is it uh should the court look look at conduct of a party because maintenance as as the as um enthroned within the MCH is a needs assessment or that really is not meant to compensate, it's not meant to reward for good conduct, you've been a good wife or you've been a good husband. That is not what maintenance is about. It's about, oh, do you need this to be able to maintain the standard of life that you parties to the marriage enjoyed before this divorce took place? But um, uh, the MCH of Nigeria expressly says that courts should look at the conduct of the parties to the marriage. So it is expressly stated. And in some lines of cases, the courts have tended to say that bad conduct will reduce the amount you are entitled to, will reduce whether they will even will determine whether you will even get maintenance or not, whether you're entitled to maintenance or not. Um, in Hui and Hui, yeah, the court said that his spouse that is applying for maintenance was who that is, or she is not responsible for the breakdown of the marriage. And where the wife had deserted the, the marriage, for no just reason, the court refused to grant her maintenance. Or Kafu and Okafu, when the were uh, there, there, when there was a unreasonable, re, you know, refusal to allow reconciliation, the wife was not given maintenance. Then delay is regarded as bad as conduct. So if you delay, the Nakanda and Nakanda after five years to bring an action for maintenance, the court said that. It was not going to grant it. In any case, that could actually show that you, you don't need it if you could survive for five years without the maintenance. Cunningham and Cunningham, adultery by the wife, with a visitor to the matrimonial home, was held to be um, a basis of denying her maintenance that you should not, for a man should not be forced to maintain an adulterous wife. And um, in, uh, in the context of uh, Africa, in Adi Yemi and Adi Yemi, and she told me, she told me, strangely, the courts had held that um, the practice of juju by <laughs> the wives, respectively, these cases did not deprive them of the entitlement for, uh, you know, of the discretion of maintenance. Conduct also, in Damilop and Damilop, the court laid down some principles on conduct that they would take into consideration. It said that um, these principles are listed said if the wife's conduct bothers on serious depravity, like we said, the one that had adultery with the visitor into the material home, even with the in-law. Um, so if a man is moral and perfidious, and, you know, so all these conducts are bothered on immorality, cruelty, especially immoral behavior, adultery, is viewed heavily by the courts, and they are likely to reject an application for maintenance. Uh, in, in, in a particular case. But again, everything borders on the facts of the case. Then all other relevant circumstances. So the court have a leeway and this general opening, you know, it's an open-ended you know, inquiry as to what are the things that the court would look at in its efforts to ensure what is fair and what is equitable in the case, in each of the cases before them. So that it's an opening broad ground that they should look at all other relevant circumstances in their discretion. Um, in that respect, the court is not going to presume that people have means or they presume your any capacity. These are things that you must bring evidence to show. It must show, and there are ways of dealing. Actually, because this couple, they are, they've been a, a couple before anyway, so you have an idea of what your husband was doing, what your wife was doing before the marriage came to an end. And um, so, but the court is not going to presume, it's not going to 
maintenance is not, is not an exercise of a guesswork. It must be based on practical evidence, real evidence. In Menakaya and Empire, the court again stated some principles that they will use in assessing maintenance. You know, there's one, it is one thing to determine that you are entitled to maintenance by looking at the means, the earning capacity, the conduct, and other relevant circumstances. It's another thing to now say this is the amount you are entitled to. So, in assessing the um, issue of what is the value, the monetary award that they should give an applicant for maintenance, some of the factors have been stated through some of these cases because the court, the MCA did not talk about so, you know, how much you should give or what the yardstick of assessment of particular amounts. Medical and Nega says, look at their income, their earning capacity, what is the property they have, what are the financial needs and responsibilities and obligations. You have legal parents, you have a, you know, if you want a man to pay maintenance to his ex, ex wife, what if you have aged parents that he has to pay? Does he have good enough children that he has, his, you know, that can support him? You know, what is the standard of life that he enjoyed before? Does he have another wife or, you know, that he has also maintained? What are the ages of the parties to the marriage and the duration? You know, if it's a short marriage, two, uh, four, three years, four years, maybe the assessment may not be as high. And it was a long marriage where they, they are advanced in age and both of them will not be, you know, their healing capacity would have, you know, be reduced. Do they have any physical or mental disability? You know that some of these reasons can be the basis of getting a divorce. So these are some of the considerations that will determine the assessment. They also look at contributions that they make to the welfare of the family, including any contribution made by looking after the house or caring for the family. And, you know, and this is very interesting, especially when you are looking eventually also at the issue of sharing assets and looking at contributions that will be made. The court has also said that they will look at the station in life of the parties. What, are, what, is, what level of life are they now? What, what, what stage of life are they middle age? Are they young people that can still do so much with their life? What is their lifestyle? What is, what are, you know, are there other, are, do they have children? Do they have children between themselves? Do they have other children with other people that they may also have to cater for? So these factors are considered holistically to arrive at what is fair and what is equitable in the facts, in the light of the circumstances of the case. Um, under the matrimonial uh, process rules, the a person that is also, if, when the when one spouse brings an application for maintenance, the other spouse is also can also bring a defense. And in a defense to that, the um, the, the matrimonial process rule says that the spouse of the claimant may admit or deny the allegation, you know, for ancillary relief, or state first that the spouse wishes to be considered for determining such relief. Where proceedings relate to maintenance of a spouse or of a child of marriage, the spouse child, if it is so, to oppose the making of the other sort, state in his defense to the proceedings the particulars of the property, income, and financial commitments of the spouse, the capacity of the spouse to earn income, the property, income, and financial commitments as they are known to the spouse, the ability or capability to earn income, you know, financial arrangements in the position between the spouses and the claimants, any order of the court under which one of the parties to the marriage is liable to make payments to the other, the ownership of the home in which the claimant is residing, and the terms of those of those of, of that residence. So these are some of the things you can bring to court if you are the one that they are claiming maintenance against, for instance, if it's the husband to help the court to make a very equitable order. And these provisions will also show you, you can compare them with what the courts have used in Menakaya and and short and short to say, okay, obviously, these are some of the things that will weigh in the mind of the court in determining whether they should grant another of maintenance and what exactly the order should be. The Masmina Forces rules in order to fight for that um, 14 allows for the presentation of a certificate of means. And uh, what it does is that uh, the party that is making the application, that, that, is the, party that, that must, the party must be seeking maintenance, settlement, or, or settlement or maintenance of a child or the marriage, or the court has the information, information that the claimant is unable to make an assessment under order five of order, I mean, other rule five of order 14 of the Marginal Process Act. So the certificate of means is issued by the court. After it has inquired into the pecuniary resources of the parties of marriage to which the certificate relates, to say this exactly is status of 
their finances and other things. So what we have now discussed today is simple. That 70 of the MCA lists the factors that the court must use to exercise its discretion in granting maintenance. So it is not for the court to just determine out of the blues. There are some laid down factors that they should look at. That And these factors have been stated as means, earning capacity, conduct of the parties to the marriage, all other relevant circumstances. And they must aim to do what is just and equitable in the light of the circumstances of each case. The judicial efforts to explain the meaning of these have been, have been, have been, have been examined. And because MCA did not define what is meant by the means or any capacity or conduct, but the cases have assisted us to know what is meant by conduct. Now, the court has also looked at, have created some principles that will assist them to assess the amount of maintenance, the what's the quantity, what what's what the financial order should entail. The whole essence is that it's not the court is not going to want to burden anyone all in the name of maintenance. And at the same time, he wants to ensure that justice is done between the parties to the marriage. Maintenance order under the Marginal Process Act is an ancillary relief. And the other ancillary reliefs are settlement of party custody of children. But maintenance is a financial order. It is granted for the benefit of the wife or the um, children of the marriage. So in this context, therefore, we you can't say that the statutory framework for the grant of maintenance order can be found under part four of the MCH, and the factors that the court would use to determine this are stated expressly under section 71 and 2 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. And these factors have been initially explained. In the next presentation, we shall be looking at another aspect of the law of maintenance under the Matrimonial Causes Act. Please don't forget to like, share, and um, subscribe to this channel. Thank you.